Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be here in my office. Thank you all for being here as well. Um, this is a joint project with um, Daniel Kasprowski, Mark Paul, and Peter Tegner. Okay, so um, I'm going to regret saying this. I, I know that the lim time limit is 40 minutes. I'm going to try to keep to this. So please, please hold me to it. So I'm going to try to be pretty general uh, and let's, let's see how that goes. Okay, so, so the, the motivating question that um, I'm thinking about is the following. Suppose you have a map of a surface inside of a four manifold. I'd like to know when I can homotope it so that it becomes a locally flat embedding. Um, so you may have thought about this question, for example, when you're thinking about here's a four manifold and I have some element of pi two, uh, it's represented by um, a map of a sphere. Can I actually homotope it so that it's an embedded sphere? Um, alternatively, if you're a knot theorist like me, you might have wondered if I have a knot in S3, it's of course the boundary of uh, the track of a null homotopy inside of B4. And we would very much like to know when I could replace that by an embedded disk. Uh, I should say, I, I said locally flat up there. This entire talk will be in the topological category, but if you would like, feel free to change that to this smooth category as appropriate. Um, anyway, so this, this is the general vicinity that we're working in. Uh, and here's the prototypical result. Here's, here's the one that got us all started. Uh, this is the disk embedding theorem. So, let me, let me just go through this theorem. Um, we're working in a connected topological manifold, um, but that may as well be smooth if you like. Um, there's a restriction on the fundamental group, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, and right now we're talking about um, surfaces, compact surface with potentially many components, but each component is simply connected. So you may as well think of this as disks or spheres. Hence, disk embedding theorem. Um, so I have a generic immersion. So you think of it as an immersion, if you like, uh, with isolated double points in the smooth category. Uh, and I have these algebraic conditions. The first condition is that algebraically, this map F should look like it's disjoint. And I'll talk about these, term, these um, terms in a second as well. Um, and then I need for my map to also have these algebraically dual spheres. These are these, uh, this map G, big G here. And then this result of uh, Friedman and Friedman and Quinn says that in this situation with this vanishing of these algebraic conditions, you can regularly homotope your map F to be a locally flat embedding. And it turns out that, you know, you had this input condition of algebraically dual spheres. Again, I'll describe that in a second, what I mean. Uh, in the output, you can even replace that by geometrically dual spheres. So, so the, idea, the idea of this theorem is that you have this algebraic information and you can translate that into geometry, which is quite cool. Um, as I mentioned, this is due to Friedman and Friedman and Quinn. It turns out this, this last part over here uh, in the case of non-simply connected fundamental groups, uh, this is due to Mark Powell, myself, and Peter Schneider. Um, and this, this result is a pretty big deal. Um, this disk embedding theorem of Friedman, uh, this, for example, leads to things like the topological h cobordism theorem, uh, the Poincaré conjecture, exactness of the surgery sequence with this good group restriction, of course, and so on. This is sort of the key thing that makes the Friedman machine, the Friedman and Quinn machine work. Okay, so I'd like, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what some of these words mean, the ones that I've highlighted in blue. So here goes. So generic immersion, um, what that means is, well, two plus two equals four. So in this category, this means that my um, surfaces intersect in isolated double points. And 
And it turns out that any continuous map uh, of a surface into a four manifold, maybe let me do that, uh, is homotopic to a generic immersion. So I'm, I'm not asking for a lot when I specify generic immersion. Uh, this thing, this fact was asserted in Friedman and Quinn, the book, uh, and you can also find some details in the recent paper of Mark and Peter and myself. So this, this condition is not very strong, uh, not very restrictive. Good groups, I'm not gonna say too much about them. You should know that abelian groups, finite groups, solvable groups, uh, all of those are good. The class of good groups is closed under these operations of subgroups, quotients, direct limits, and so on. Um, it's not known whether all groups are good. For example, we don't know whether the free group on two generators is, is good. Uh, if, if we did know all groups were good, then we would be able to apply the disk embedding theorem very broadly. And that, that's one of the big open questions in the field of topological four manifolds. Um, but the takeaway from this is that there are many good groups and it'd be great if all of them were good. We don't know, it's possible, but not known. Next, what do I mean by intersection numbers? So here on the left, I've drawn you two pictures of, let's say, spheres intersecting uh, generically. So that's a generic immersion, because the double points are isolated and double points. Okay, does that make sense? The circles are meant to represent some spheres intersecting in a four manifold. Uh, the intersection number lambda f of g, f comma g, is defined as follows. Uh, I started the base point of my four manifold, indicated here by this star, uh, and then I take some path is from the base point to the two spheres, f and g, or surfaces in general. And then for each intersection point p, I'm going to take the loop at that base point given by traveling, traveling from the base point to the first sphere along the first curve, then to the intersection point, then down the other sphere, and then back to the base point along this curve. So that describes an element of the fundamental group of the four manifold based at that base point. And the intersection number uh, lambda fg, this is defined to be the sum over the intersection points p over the sine of the intersection point and these curves gamma of p. So right now, as I've def defined it, this lives inside of the group ring z pi one. And it turns out that if uh, f and g are simply connected, this thing is well-defined. Okay, so this, this is the algebraic intersection number. Um, I talked about this, this number vanishing. So what does it mean for this to vanish? Uh, well, it turns out the vanishing has a nice geometric characterization. Uh, these two, uh, this, this count vanishes if and only if uh, all the points all the intersection points of F and G are paired by immersed, generically immersed uh, Whitney disks with framed um, disjoint embedded boundaries. So what does this mean? This means that, um, so if I have two intersection points, P and Q, such as the two that are described on this left here, I'm sorry that my Q looks like a G, I promise that's a Q. So a Whitney disk would be something that lives between 
these two points right there. So it has boundary arcs connecting P and Q, one arc on F and one arc on G. The nicest Whitney disk would be this one down here. The thing I'm highlighting in the picture. So if you could find an embedded Whitney disk, you'd be able to just move your surfaces along that embedded Whitney disk and separate them. There's a framing condition that's necessary for this to work. That's why I use the word framed, not going into that very much. But algebraically, the vanishing of lambda means that there's some immersed disk in F sort of filling in for that highlighted yellow disk. And I, I should specify that I mean an F in M. So for example, this Whitney disk might intersect F or G. So it's just somewhere in M interacting in uncontrolled ways with F and G. So the vanishing of algebraic intersection number lambda has this geometric interpretation. Uh, and then this, I'm going to define this to mean a generic collection of Whitney disks. So you should really think about this as if I could find embedded Whitney disks, then I could solve my problem. But algebraically, all I can hope for is that there are immersed Whitney disks. So this is telling you that you have the algebra, but you want the geometry. Okay. Uh, there's something called a self-intersection number. Um, I'm only going to give you the geometric interpretation of that. Uh, this, um, for, a, for, a, for an immersed surface, for an immersed discourse sphere F, mu of F is zero, the self-intersection number, if all the self-intersections are paired by a generic collection of Whitney disks, Uh, and then lastly, I use this term algebraically dual. Algebraically dual by definition is when lambda of f and g equals one, which means that all but one intersection point are paired by a generic collection of Whitney disks. So those are some definitions. That brings us back to the disk embedding theorem. And at this point, I've defined all of these terms. Does that, any questions about the terms? Duncan, you are muted. Oh, good, at least my camera's on so you can see my mouth moving. Um, <laughs> so this, this definition of algebraically dual, I mean, it's saying that bit more than you can just pair all but one of these, isn't it? Is it not putting some condition on the remaining intersection point as well? Hmm. So one, one thing to note, note is that, for example, I didn't say anything about these choices of whiskers. So really, if I were being very careful, this would have been gamma. Like if this was a single element of pi one of M, then I would be able to change this choice of uh, whisker somehow. Okay. But for all of the other ones, you know, the, the idea of this, this proof is that, um, so you have this whisker like this, yeah. and that gives you a gamma. If you also knew that for Q, that thing was the same because these things have to cancel yep. for it to be, then the difference between them is precisely this thing that looks like a Whitney circle. And that's how you're getting that there have to be these Whitney disks. Yeah. So, so I that's, guess like, okay, yeah, I can, I can see that. I guess then maybe my question is when you say this is well-defined, I mean, um, I, I guess my question then sort of passes to be, well, what does it, what does changing these whiskers do to the intersection? Right. Nothing, is this? No, no, this is a great question. So it does, it changes the values. 
right? Yeah. Like if I change the whisker, if I change, let me draw this picture. So if I change the whisker like this, so if this is V1 and this is V2, then changing the whisker um, changes the value of lambda FG by um, multiplication on the left by V1, V2 inverse, or potentially V2, V1 inverse, I can't tell, right? Okay, because, sure. um, so the new value changes by that loop. But what's really cool is that if you're thinking about the value zero, that didn't change, sure. right? So that's why being zero or being one is somehow well-defined irrespective of base points, et cetera. None of our base points, whiskers, none of that mattered for you. So that's like, right. So vanishing is something which is somehow deeper than just the value, yeah. if, okay. if that happens. Okay, and, and then so when you say algebraically dual, you just sort of mean that you just have a sort of a, a single group element left over and then you're implicitly changing the path to make sure that thing is one. Absolutely, that's okay. right. Thank you. That, that's exactly right. I think if, if you want to be very precise and that is very commendable, that is the correct way to think about it. Okay. If you don't want to be precise and you're just thinking about like, what's the idea? It's like when you have the quantity zero, it means algebraically you have nothing to worry about. And the quantity one means that algebraically there's just one that's left over. I, I didn't define what geometrically dual means. Geometrically dual means that the geometry does actually match. So you have actually a single intersection. And the others are not just paired by Whitney disks. There aren't any others. There's just a single intersection point. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So um, this is the disk embedding theorem. So I would like to upgrade it. Let me upgrade it to the surface embedding theorem. So the point is that I can get rid of some of these hypotheses. That's, that's the main point. So I, I still have this requirement of the good fundamental group that's a hallmark of the Friedman and Quinn world. However, I can get rid of this. So I no longer need to require that each sigma i is simply connected. Generic immersion condition was not so bad. And I can get rid of this thing. I no longer need a framed algebraically dual sphere, where framed means that the normal bundle has trivial Euler number, don't need that. And then I still get this condition that I'm regularly homotopic to a locally flat embedding, but I have a new invariant that pops up. Uh, and that invariant is called the Kerber Milner invariant. It takes values in Z2. And I have this homotopy to an embedding if and only if this invariant vanishes. So once you get rid of these conditions, there's this additional thing that pops up. So this, um, you know, it, it of course, it's based on the work of Friedman and Friedman and Quinn. Uh, there's some uh, work of Stong that goes into this. Um, but then this is the result that I'm talking about that's joined with Daniel, Mark, and Peter. So that's the statement. That's a weird statement. So let me just talk about some corollaries, which are uh, a bit more digestible. Um, okay, so here's a nice statement. Suppose you have a surface, connected surface, immersed in a four manifold M with these vanishing intersection numbers and a dual sphere. Then let F prime be the result of adding a trivial tube To F. Meaning just that you have your surface uh, in a little local neighborhood at a little handle um, in, a, in a little B4. So the moment you do that, we can show that the Kerber Milner invariant vanishes and therefore you are regularly homotopic to an embed. 
So once you stabilize, there are no problems left. Second corollary, suppose you have a connected surface, but now you have positive genus necessarily, uh, and the ambient manifold is, say, simply connected, still have these requirements on intersection numbers and the dual sphere. Now you don't even have to do any stabilization. You immediately know that you're regularly homotopic to an embed. Here's, here's an example that's kind of concrete, if, if you like that. So I could start with uh, B4, uh, and let's attach a two handle uh, with plus or minus one framed, plus or minus one framing uh, two handle along some knot K in S3. That's a perfectly fine simply connected four manifold. Inside of there, you can take, uh, so your, your knot is in there. The knot bounds some track of a regular homotopy. You can fix it up so that it has trivial algebraic intersection numbers. You cap it off with the core of this two handle. That's a sphere, that's an immersed sphere inside of the four manifold. It turns out this guy has a dual sphere uh, that requires this plus or minus one framing. Its push off is a dual sphere. It's not framed. It has framing plus or minus one, depending on what you did. And then now if you add a little tube to this, um, let's just add a little local tube to this, uh, this thing will become regularly homotopic to an embedding. So our corollary of this is that, um, corollary of this corollary is that um, the topological shake genus of a knot is always less than or equal to one. And this was also proved uh, in a separate work with Peter Feller, Matthias Nagel, no, no, missed a letter. Peter Feller, Allison Miller, Matthias Nagel, Patrick Orson, Mark Powell, and myself. Um, no, no co-author left behind. So these are, these are some concrete um, things where you don't have to know what the curve Milner invariant is in order to understand what's going on. Okay. Um, sorry, by shake slice genus here, I, do you need to append that with a plus or minus one? Ah, yes, thank you. Uh, plus or, oh dear, uh, plus or minus one. Okay. Thank you, sorry. I, you should just read my mind. Obviously, there is a plus or minus one there. Thank you for that. that. That's very important. So the one plus or minus one topological shape genus of an op came is always less than or equal to one. Thank you. Okay. Just some, an, a note on uh, some previous work. So the closest result to this in the literature comes from Friedman and Quinn, not surprising. Uh, this is in chapter 10 of their book. Um, I, this is kind of difficult to parse, but let me try to parse it for you. This is a screenshot from the PDF of their book. Um, so here, you should, you should really think about this part as saying that the algebraic conditions vanish. And the curvier Milner invariant is also in there somewhere. But the, but the main difference is that over here, they have this requirement on uh, simple connectivity. So there's no requirement on framing on the dual spheres or anything like that, but they're only thinking about um, simply connected surfaces, whereas we're thinking about something more general. Um, there is a correction of this by Strong, which is what I was alluded to earlier, but let's not go into that. But you might, you might wonder, well, why can't we just apply this Friedman and Quinn result to um, to get the result that I'm claiming. I should say that there's, uh, uh, there should be a geometrically dual sphere, uh, algebraically dual sphere on this, right? So here um, I could just think, one might think here's my surface, uh, here's my uh, image of my surface inside of my four manifold M. Well, I could just embed the one skeleton of my surface. That's easy, that's just general position. And then the complement of that is a two handle. Two handles are nice and simply connected. So I could then use the Friedman Quinn result to embed that two handle. So why can't I just do that? The thing is, so oh, let, me, let me try to write that. Uh, embed uh, one skeleton by general position 
uh, use Friedman Quinn for the two handle. Um, the difference is that you have to make this choice of the one skeleton. And depending on the one skeleton you choose, your two handle embedding problem becomes different. And so there are good and bad choices, right? Um, so Peter explains this in a nice way. He makes this comparison to obstruction theory because when you're trying to extend maps, for example, you, you extend it cell by cell, you go to the one skeleton, now you wanna extend it to the two skeleton. Well, sometimes you've made a bad choice. You have to go back and change that initial choice. And so that's in a sense what we're doing. And that's, that's precisely, um, you'll, you'll see in a moment when I talk about this invariant where that comes up. Here's an aside, um, sort of, I've been sort of kind of sweeping this under the rug. I was talking about intersection numbers, but now of surfaces. I only told you it's well-defined when those guys are simply connected. Now there's genus around. So now what happens is once again, I would like to try to compute lambda. Well, I can choose some arcs that go to my surface, but then now instead of going directly to P, I could travel around some interesting curve inside of my surface. I could wrap around a lot of this thing. Um, I could also do it on the right-hand side. I just don't want to draw it. So because you have all of these choices in these paths, in this choice of the curve gamma, um, you no longer get a well-defined element in Z pi one of M, but really you need to uh, take, you really need to consider something like a, a double cos, double, oh dear, a double coset space. That's the thing, right? You know, in the sense that the values you take, you might have to multiply on the left by something, but also on the right by something. So you have to sort of quotient out by something, like something more complicated. However, worth noting, um, one point, the geometric characterization of the vanishing of algebraic intersection numbers, that doesn't change. And second point, having the genus actually made it easier for these numbers to vanish. Because earlier, I just had one choice of path on my surface F and my surface G because they were simply connected, all paths are homotopic. But now I get to run around some curves on my surface and if my surface is embedded interestingly in the four manifold, some of those choices might be better than others. So when you're looking at vanishing of intersection numbers of surfaces, genus helps you. Okay. And that's also some, somehow the principle of why um, the Friedman Quinn results I quoted a moment ago, that's trying to embed disks. But for us, when you're trying to embed the actual full surface, we can take advantage of this extra pi one and make our problem a little bit easier. So in a way, that's, that's sort of the philosophical idea. Okay. So, sorry, just to be pedantic again. So maybe, can, can I sort of somehow think of your lambda f of g as some subset of this group ring, and then your condition that it vanishes is saying that that subset contains the zero element. Is that what this is saying? That's a great way to think about it. Okay, so you might think, so I think the way to say it would be, you know, that your surfaces are fixed and you're just trying to find these gammas and you have lots of different options, really infinitely many options. You, need, you just need to find one right one. So as long as you can find, as long as there exists a correct choice, this thing is trivial. Other questions? I love pedantic questions, they're the best. Okay, um, great. Um, right, so what, what on earth is this curve Vermeulen invariant? So I'd like to tell you about that next. Um, for disks and spheres, this was defined by Friedman and Quinn and Stong. So um, just, just to keep a note of that, the definition I'll give is unified. You'll see that it, it will apply to them as well. Um, it's defined when you have these zeroth order 
obstructions should already vanish. So you should have these algebraic intersection numbers vanish already. Uh, and then we'll use this geometric characterization. This means that there exists some collection of Whitney disks generically immersed pairing these intersection points. And then now the framed, uh, the framing on the dual spheres will come in. So I'm specifically thinking about like F squiggle is the subset of F, which has twisted dual spheres, which means that the Euler number of the normal bundles are odd. So those are the twisted dual spheres, and I'll only consider the subset of F, which has those. If you like, you may as well think that all of them have twisted dual spheres, that's fine. And then I'll consider the subset of the Whitney disks, which are specifically pairing the intersections of this twisted subsurface, okay? So I have my whole surface, I only look at the ones that have twisted dual spheres, and then I only look at the Whitney disks that are pairing those intersections. And then the curvier Milner invariant with respect to those, that collection of Whitney disks is precisely the count of the intersections of the interiors of those Whitney disks with those twisted guys. So remember, one way to think about it is that if my Whitney disks were away from F, that would be very nice. So this is counting how far away it is from being disjoint from F. Uh, at this point, you should have a question. Uh, when is this count independent? This guy, uh, I, I will talk about this, but not right now. Thoughts in this definition? Uh, I mean, I'm a little bit confused. I mean, are you something about is sigma assumed to be connected? I mean, I'm struggling to see how you could have a subset with a twisted dual sphere and a subset without. Ah, because um, we're, th <laughs> um, okay. If you're thinking of them as being connected, then they either have or have not twisted okay. dual spheres, but I was thinking of sigma as being potentially disconnected. Okay. That was the point. So sigma uh, is this union of sigma i. Um, but if you would like to think of them as being connected, that's totally fine. Um, then if, you, if your dual sphere is untwisted, then you're done. There's no invariant, uh, there's no obstruction, golden. And if it is twisted, then you have to do this count. If you have many components, you have to just, you only have to focus in on the guys which have, um, which have twisted dual spheres. Um, that's why also there's that disjoint union symbol there. So you have lots of, you have as many dual spheres as there are components. Okay, I missed that. I, I sort of never mentioned that, but thank you. Okay, um, I, I would like to talk about this independence uh, of, from the collection of Whitney disks in a second, but let's, let's uh, I, I'll just tell you the proof outline first. So suppose there exists a collection of Whitney disks for which this count is trivial. This thing is, in, this thing is mod two, right? So I've put in gray the parts that are only about getting the geometrically dual spheres. So if you only care about uh, F bar, embedding F, then just ignore it. So the first step is going to be, we're going to make F and G geometrically dual. Uh, this is a standard trick and I'm not going to talk about it. But this doesn't embed them. If we could embed them and do this, then we'd be done. So, but at the expense of adding some more intersections, we can make them geometrically dual, fine. Step two is the most important part. Um, step two, I'll talk about in a second, how to do it. So step two says that we can upgrade our Whitney disks and our surface F, again by regular homotopy, 
such that the interiors of the Whitney disks are just far away from F. So there are no intersections whatsoever. So the algebra is mirrored by the geometry. The algebra said there were mod two zero intersections and now there are literally no intersections. And then after that, the proof is kind of simple. We have these immersed disks, immersed disks WL in the complement of F. I use my disk embedding theorem. It's really the Whitney disk embedding theorem at this point to embed those Whitney disks. But once I have embedded Whitney disks, well, I can just do the Whitney move. And a Whitney move is a regular homotopy. So I've produced for you my embedded surface F bar as necessary. Okay. Um, that's the outline. You have these immersed, you have F and G, they intersect, you make them geometrically dual. Don't worry about how to do that. Using the curve Milner invariant vanishing, we'll get some Whitney disks that are disjoint from the surface that you need to embed. Disk embedding theorem will make those Whitney disks embedded, but still in the complement. Uh, and then once we do the Whitney move, we get an embedding. I should say that you might think about what about this good group hypothesis, etc. Uh, and you don't have to worry about it because since G is geometrically dual, uh, the complement of F has the same fundamental group as M, and that's why it's still good. But again, I'm, I'm not going to make the 40 minute mark, but I'm, I'm trying. It's, it's fine. You can run over a bit. At least that's fine okay. by me. Other people might object, but. Okay. Um, okay. So that's the, that's the outline. Um, I'm going to, let me talk about step two. The goal is that I have these Whitney disks and I want to um, upgrade them. Um, okay, so F only moves by a regular homotopy. W is moving not by a regular homotopy. So, but don't worry about that. Uh, here's, here's my situation. I have my Whitney disk, W, it's in green right now. It's pairing some points of, F. it's pairing some intersection points of F. I'm just showing a little part of this. And other bits of F are intersecting it. Two plus two is still four, so those intersections are still in points. And now I have these geometrically dual spheres G hanging off of this, these Fs. So what I can do is I can tube these Whitney disks into these geometrically dual spheres. So the point is that if, if a GI is framed, is, is not twisted, sorry, this is fine. This changes uh, the framing of the Whitney disks by an even number. Alternatively, if GI is twisted, uh, it would change it by an odd number. Not surprising. But if I had two of these uh, twisted guys, then I would still change by an even number. And uh, there's this local maneuver that you can do, um, which can change the framing by plus or minus two. So if you change the framing by mistake by an even number, we're not concerned. So you can do this tubing maneuver to change the framing by any number, any even number, and that's fine. Okay. What's the remaining problem? So we might have some Whitney disks for F with a single problem each, which means that um, we have um, Whitney disks pairing uh, both sheets and the intersection are, uh, have twisted duals. But because curve Milner is zero with respect to these Whitney disks, that means that there are even such disks. So we can pair them up. And what I can do is now, um, uh, in this picture, I'm showing you two such disks that have been paired. 
So I'm going to do a finger move uh, between, uh, let's say, F4 and F1, which means that F4 will come in and intersect F1 like this. And now here you can see a Whitney disk for this intersection right here underneath F1 squiggle. So right now I haven't done anything. I've just added an extra Whitney disk to my system F, which doesn't intersect anything. But now I'm going to change them a little bit. So I'm going to change them in a way that I'd like to explain to you using uh, this arc. So this is meant to be the bottom of the Whitney disk. So I had this, this Whitney disk here, but now I have added sort of a little entrance to an igloo down below. Um, so that new Whitney disk after it's been moved has that intersection, has that new intersection with F. And then the Whitney disk that I had up top that also has this little thing and that too has had added this new intersection with an F. This thing is called the transfer move. So, so far what I've done is I've added this new Whitney disk to my system. The old Whitney disk used to have this intersection with an F, but now picked up this intersection with F, so now it has two. And then this new one, I've changed it, so it has one intersection with F. But the other sheet of this guy, the one that's not on F, that's actually on this sheet. So this picture also shows up here. And then I can do the maneuver that I did on this side, also on this side. Um, so I should point out that these two are the same. And then now uh, this disc has picked up an intersection here, but this new guy, let's say W, this has picked up a second one. And so that's why my new Whitney disk also has two intersections, two new intersections with twisted Fs. That was really fast. How are you all feeling? Steve is nodding. Duncan is holding his hands, holding his head in despair. Um, so I like to think this Whitney arc move that's like a finger move along a surface. So if you can imagine that sort of geometrically, that's that's the correct way to think about it, I think. Um, so really what's happening is I had this nice flat Whitney disc, and then now I added this little tunnel. And that picture that I'm drawing on the bottom left there, that's repeated four times in this diagram. So if you can understand this thing on the left, that's what's happening. Okay. But hey, we're kind of done now because what have we done? We've changed our F by a regular homotopy so that this new collection of Whitney disks, each Whitney disk has two problems. But I already know how to deal with problems in pairs because I have two intersections with Fs with twisted duals. So I can still, I can again do my tubing maneuver. I change my framing by an even number, fine, I fix it. So by using this, I can get rid of all the intersections of my Whitney disks with F. Now my Whitney disks are in the complement and then I'm, then I'm done. That completes step two. And that completes the proof. Okay. Uh, 
um, questions. All right. Well, Let me take a couple. Oh, yes. Oh, uh, yeah, not about that. I have a general question, but yeah, continue. Uh, I'll ask it at the end. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do this uh, in a flash. Um, let's see how that goes. So I want to talk about this independence of the curvier Müller invariant from the Whitney disks. Um, and for now, just for convenience, let's just assume everything is oriented and connected. That will, that will make our lives a bit easier. Uh, here's a situation where it's not well-defined. I'm going to change the Whitney disk so that this curvier Milner count will change. So suppose I have a sphere in my four manifold that intersects F differently from how it intersects with itself. In particular, F is not characteristic. That's what this is telling me. So if I had a situation like this, I could just tube the interior of a Whitney disk to an S. And now in this situation, for example, in case one, you'll notice that F dot S being odd means that this changes the KM count. Uh, and this is even, so I can fix by cusps as I did before. Um, in the other case, it's a bit harder. It's, it's a bit more subtle, but not by that much. Uh, this seems to indicate that the curvier Milner count does not change, but because this changes, you can fix this s dot s that changes the framing by an odd number. And to fix it, you get an additional intersection with f. So having such a sphere in your manifold means that curvier Milner is not well-defined because I just showed you how to change the count by one. So if this does not happen, f is set to be s characteristic, sphere character, spherically characteristic. It turns out um, there's an ad additional condition. This is the correction that Stong made if you could find an immersed RP2 inside of your four manifold, once again, such that the self-intersection is different from its intersection with F mod two, then you can once again change the um, curve Milner count. Here's briefly what you do. So you can just push your RP2 until it intersects F in a nice little disc additionally. And then now, you do, a, so what you have now is a Mobius strip, a Mobius band with boundary on F. So do a finger move along a fiber of this band, which means that um, you push out a finger along one of these sides, it continues along this RP2, and then it'll come back down like this. So you're doing a finger move, so it has a canonical Whitney disk, this thing that's sometimes called the fingernail Whitney disk, which is quite nice. But instead of using that one, you can choose another one coming from this RP2. And that corresponds to changing the arcs, the Whitney arcs on the surface F. And when you do that, this, this intersection right here, or this condition right here tells you that you've changed the curvier Milner count. So if you don't have that, you're set to be R characteristic. Promise I'm very close now. Now, suppose you have, now you're looking at um, this subgroup of a uh, homology group, which is represented by maps of annuli or Mobius bands. So if you know that the Z2 intersection form on your surface is non-trivial on the boundary of this, this subset, uh, then you can change the curvier Milner count. Basically, the point is that um, the non-triviality means that there exist bands B1 and B2 such that the intersection of the boundaries is not equal to zero mod two. So here's what you do. Either the, the band finger move on B1, B2, or both, one of these will change the curvier Milner count. 
So either doing it on B1 will suffice or on B2, but if both of them don't work, then you do both of them. And then because you have this non-trivial self-intersection here, this odd self-intersection, that gets picked up in the Kerver Milner count because this thing is non-zero mod two. Uh, okay. And then lastly, if you know that this intersection on the boundary of bands is trivial, then we can define something complicated like this. And if it turns out that there's a band for which that thing is non-zero, uh, then once again, we can change KM. Let me not go into that. And then finally, what we can show is that suppose all of those things do not happen, that's it. That's the only thing that can go wrong. So if you have that this intersection form on the boundary of bands is trivial, and this formula that I just gave last page is zero, then we say that your surface is B characteristic. And that's precisely the situation where the Whitney disk um, choices don't matter. Okay, so that was a lot of stuff, but let me, let me put it this way. Because in many steps of this last few slides, we were able to change the choice of arcs on the surface. And by choosing those arcs in an interesting way, we were able to make the Kerber Milner count go to zero. And that's precisely you're changing uh, sort of your choice of the one skeleton. You're changing how uh, you're getting your Whitney disks. And that's what the positive genus is giving you. Uh, and that's why you're, it's easier for our Kerber Milner invariant to be zero, which means that it's easier for our surfaces to get embedded. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thanks, thanks, Aru. Are there any any questions? Yeah, I just have a, I guess, a straightforward question. So, you show the plus minus one shape genus of an odd is at most one. Can you characterize uh, those of shape genus one as like Garf invariant one or something like that? Ah, so it turns out that um, yes, that is true. So it is. So um, maybe I can go back to this. So it turns out that, um, oh, no, it's somewhere here. Um, another result of this, this paper is that um, G top shake plus or minus one of K is zero if and only if the ARF invariant is zero. Yes. Um, so that is, in fact, Wait, so I can do that. I can do that here too. So um, let me let me let me draw a slightly diff extremely familiar picture at this point. So what we did before is we said um, here's your not k, and we um, found the track of a null homotopy for it inside of before, and then I capped it off with the core of the of the two handle, and then. Of course, uh, this is, I said the algebraic intersection number is vanished, so there's this, there is a Whitney disk, and then I can count the intersections of that Whitney disk, the interiors, with the sphere that I defined here, F. It turns out that count is equal to the ARF invariant, because that's one of the, one of the, that's a nice four-dimensional way to see, to compute the ARF invariant. And that also coincides with the curve Müller invariant of this sphere that I defined, right? So once, if you know that your ARF invariant is zero, then the curve Müller invariant vanishes and you can use this sphere embedding theorem, surface embedding theorem to just get for yourself uh, an embedded sphere representing the generator of H2. Um, and then that shows this, that shows, one, that shows the interesting direction of this result that I've stated. I, I'm sorry, I, this is 20. Unrelated. Um, um, maybe shameless plug for uh, this other paper. Here we characterize um, the topological shake sliceness, plus or minus one shake sliceness in terms of barf invariant. 
We also classify um, N shake sliceness topologically for knots K. Um, then there are some more conditions that arise on the right hand side. They're extremely computable. The only difference is that there's a restriction on the fundamental group of the complement. The complement has to be abelian, abelian pi one. Um, but that's a different talk, so I'll stop. Uh, uh, are there any, any other questions? Let's uh, thank you again.